Thanks for joining us for this episode of Legends and Losers with the incredible Jordan French. We talk about why money is outdated technology, blockchain, how Jordan made a completely unique place in the world, personalized food, 3D printing, and a lot more. All right, all right, all right. Hey ho, let's go. Hello, my legendary friends. This is Christopher Lockhead, and man, am I ever glad you've joined us for this episode of Legends and Losers. We have an incredible guest, Jordan French. And off the top, I would like to remind you that we are sponsored by our good friends at Oracle NetSuite. To turbocharge the growth of your organization, I would encourage you to check out netsuite.com slash legends. Now, Jordan is a combination of an engineer, an attorney, an entrepreneur, and growth hacker. He's also a prolific writer. He writes for thestreet.com and CIO, just to name a few. Uh, he's been named a Fast 50 and Inc. 500 entrepreneur, and he's an incredibly impressive guy. Now, uh, I want to thank you again for joining us. I hope you're doing great. I hope your family's great. I hope your life's great. I hope uh, um, 2018's working out. On Legends and Losers, we aspire to have conversations that are fun, make a difference, and hopefully you find worth sharing. For more information on Jordan and his bio, check out our show notes at legendsandlosers.com. We'd also love it if you subscribe. And you can find more about Jordan at jordanfrench.org. All one word, jordanfrench.org. Here he is, the incredible Jordan French. Um, I'm on the editorial staff at thestreet.com. Uh, it's a pretty big financial publication that's in the cohort of uh, Yahoo Finance and CNBC and uh, originally Mark founded Mark by Mark Kramer, Mark. if I'm remembering right. Yeah, exactly. It's it's been around for over 20 years, I and mean, there's a there's a big big following. Again, one of those that does a lot of broad broad coverage uh, in the investment world, and um, there's there's a lot on the editing end. On the on the writing end, though, my beat is pretty narrow in the cryptocurrency and blockchain space, and that's. Yeah. That's a whole other Pandora's box we can definitely talk about. In fact, I was just finishing up a piece on uh, healthcare and the impact of blockchain on uh, healthcare stocks, big pharma, and where that goes. Um, I'll just share you a quick nug and a preview of it. I, Did you um, say a quick uh, nug? Yeah, a quick nugget from it. Oh, nugget. Uh, I thought you said a quick nugget. nugget. <laughs> Sorry, you know where my mind is. Yeah, and that um, yeah, and that that nugget comes from from Mike Butcher actually. So he's a um, uh, he's a colleague, a peer, uh, maybe even a mentor in some ways over at over at TechCrunch, uh, over based in the UK, and uh, he covers a lot of this area too. And he opined for this for this particular piece and said, just to can encapsulate it very simply, and he's and he's a he's a pretty blunt guy. He said, imagine having a personalized mobile record of all your health information that's secure and follows you around. Uh, one that if you get overexposed or have too many x-rays, it tells you to prevent that next x-ray from, uh, from beaming at you. So uh, that gives us an idea uh, of, of kind of where, where blockchain technology is headed. It's one of the industries, you know, one of the things I'm aiming to do and have done at least a little bit so far, Chris, uh, with my writing there and on that subject is really try to explain the breadth of uh, that kind of technology. I'm referring to, to the blockchain. You know, well, the best and if analogy, I could interrupt you, I, I, sure. I, I want to unpack your thoughts on blockchain in a sec, but just before we do that, I want to thank you for that. Because one of the things I've wondered is, and I get that cryptocurrencies are very sexy and, and headline grabbing and all that, and, right. and, and they should be, by the way. I think it's a very fascinating thing. And, you know, we can talk about that, too. However, that said, Jordan, you tell me if, if uh, you think I'm wrong. The real story is actually blockchain. Not that cryptocurrency isn't a big story, but the, the real thing that's going to have the even bigger impact over a longer period of time feels like it's actually the blockchain. It's going to re-swizzle, uh, <laughs> reimagine recreate a lot of things in our world if I if, if I get it right and I listen I'm, I'm just trying to educate myself but uh, is that do you feel that 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 the blockchain blockchain itself is not getting the depth and breadth of uh, coverage and conversation that it probably should because it's a little bit overshadowed by cryptocurrency or, or am I wrong about that 
Yeah, well, the the latter part, yeah, you're you're definitely right about. Um, it does it does get overshadowed. Uh, in the words of Warren Buffett, the, the kind of famed investor over at Berkshire Hathaway, you know, dynamism and prices, uh, especially the upside, it, it it attracts eyeballs. It attracts investor eyeballs, and people are drawn to, you know, when uh, some of these kind of latest cryptocurrencies and tokens skyrocket a few thousand percent. People want in on that. It's very reminiscent of kind of earlier big price movements. I remember kind of 1999, 2000 era. You know, you I know you I knew and I know you know that world too. I was in the uh, show. Uh, yeah, you <laughs> saw. That's when I was still of, playing guitar professionally. <laughs> yeah, so with with little we had, you know, in general, um, you, you just saw some tech stocks. Uh, the kind of everything from Pets.com to to um, kind of like trend switch and a lot of companies that a lot of people just didn't know anything about. There were definitely some poster child children too, uh, for the era that were, that were, um, you know, some, some companies that had gone public, uh, but you saw a massive, massive price movement. It attracted a lot of money into that sector. And then we all know what happened next. Um, it went bust. Now that's not necessarily, uh, a prescription or a proscription, I should say for what happens to, to the crypto world. That said, you know, that, that is what's gone on more recently. What I do think will happen is that will actually continue. You know, we're just because you're in a bubble or even if you're not, um, that doesn't mean it can't continue on for a very, very, very long time. I do think that will happen based off of the, the kind of price action uh, and, and, uh, and cash that's out there that's interested in it, that hasn't accessed the market yet. But going upstream to your first question, you know, in some ways, before, you're actually before wrong. We go, before we oh. go there, I, I'd love for you to tell me how wrong I am. That'd be awesome. Uh, I, by the way, I have no commitment to being right about any of this stuff. You know, uh, I'm an incredibly and same cur- here. I'm an incredibly curious person. I think this is a side note, but I think one of the problems in our world today is we've forgotten how to have authentic dialogue. We've forgotten how to have a uh, how to disagree agreeably if we're going to do that. Um, and you know, one of my favorite expressions, Jordan, is if you haven't changed your mind lately, how do you know you have one? Right. And there's a lot of things that at one point in my life, I believed X was the way it should be, or was quote unquote, right. And over time, you know, you learn things and you go, why? I don't, I'm not sure. Why do I believe that? And then you start to really look at it for yourself. So, you know, I, I, I have no attachment to any of it. Uh, okay. So with that, but on, on, on cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, and I don't say this like a conclusion that I'm at, but uh, where it's swizzling in my head right now, where it wasn't when I first heard about it. When I first heard about it, I thought it was interesting, but I sort of thought, well, why the fuck do we need a digital currency or currencies, right? I was ignorant about that and I didn't give it a lot of thought. As I have given it more thought and more smart folks like you who are in the space, uh, you know, are, are, are good enough to educate me, you tell me if this is how you think about it. We are now at a place with e-commerce or digital commerce or e-business or whatever the fuck you want to call it, where the notion of a physical currency that is tied to one country is actually uh, bad design. Bad, if you want to call currency a product, right? then there was a product design a, and a category design to go with it that worked for a long time with, with physical currency backed by, you know, originally the gold, gold standard. Of course, we're not on that anymore. Uh, but the, the physical currency, different countries, da, 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 right? But what folks like you have been educating me on is that traditional paradigm of the way we think about currency is actually ill-suited to uh, the future of commerce, and therefore a new category of currency is required. Am I learning this right, or how do you think about it? Yeah, it, my my ideas are on the on the kind of really broad thesis are pretty pretty adjacent to yours. So if you if if you want to put it this way, the U.S. dollar, the euro, yen, what whatever uh, the currencies. It's really just a technology, right? I mean, at some point we came out with pieces of paper or coinage 
uh, someone had to come up with that. There, there's definitely an inventive step. It's, it's literally a technology and to some degree it's outdated. Uh, and we've already seen a pretty ferocious movement away and, from And in your it. opinion, I hate to interrupt you, but I, I w- want to make sure I understand. Why do you think, you know, traditional currencies are outdated? What's the problem with traditional currencies that, that cryptocurrencies solve in your mind, uh, Jordan? Well, yeah, and it's even before you even get to cryptocurrencies, right? I mean, it's it's a physical object, right? So we didn't have much of a, not not, not even just kind of like a, a, a ledger that most cryptocurrencies offer, but uh, you know any sort of reasonable tracking system besides maybe an abacus or a piece of paper that you can scroll on and and then easily lose to track you know who and when and where a transaction occurred, right? So so one of the biggest issues with physical currencies is that they're divorced from the record of title over which. You know, that physical currency was held, right? So what, what happened a bit later is as the kind of computer age uh, came upon us, we did, thankfully, and it's fueled our economy greatly, Chris, uh, it, it, certainly in, in the financial world, is, is marry the two, right? And get some sort of digital record out there. Uh, and that's what we see often, you know, it's how we get paid, right? Let's, let's take a really good example. Um, you know, a lot of people out there, W-2, W-4 employees, they receive an electronic transfer, right, of money into a bank account. No longer is it physical cash uh, in most cases that you're getting handed whenever you, whenever you get paid. So, well, so and that's and an that point. You're, you're, you're so right. And, and yep. our, um, our world has already said to us, there's a limit to which uh, this physical currency works. That's right. Can I tell you a funny story about this? Oh, I love it. Please do. So my last real job was, I was the head of the marketing for this company called Mercury Interactive. And we ended up selling the company to Hewlett Packard in, 26, in uh, 2016. Yeah, right. 2006, asshole. Uh, in 2006, making Hewlett Packard my favorite company of all time. And because I was a senior guy in the company, there was a, a collection of us. Um, we had these things called change in control agreements, CICs. And essentially what it means is if somebody buys the company, you know, you forward vest your stock and you get some Scooby snacks and, and, and so forth. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's a reasonable chunk of change. And so they buy the company and they, uh, you know, God bless them. They inform me that I'm fired, uh, which is, which is great. And because um, you don't get your CIC if you're not fired, right? They have to not hire you, right? And uh, Tom Hogan, who's the head of uh, HP Software, I remember he called me and he said, look, Chris, we just love the hard work you're putting into this integration. I can't thank you enough. And he's very, very laudatory. It was very sweet of him. And he said, and I want you to know that I know there's no job for you at HP that you're going to do. So we're going to honor your CIC and, and thank you so much for your service. And it was great. So... I went to my boss, the CEO of Mercury at the time, and I said, hey, listen, tell the HP guys I want my change in control in cash. Mm. They won't do it. They will not give you your money in cash. And so it's interesting, right? Of course, I'm sure as you, you, you know, if you, if you take out more than 10, or 10 grand or more the, from the bank, from your own fucking account, you, it gets recorded with the government, right? And so, so Hewlett Packard would not be, was not willing to give me a, a duffel bag full of cash. It's a real shame. This, it's so un-American of them. Too. Well, yeah, because I wanted to see the cash. I mean, yeah. you think about it. What's the most amount of cash... You know, listen, I was never a drug dealer or any of these things. And so I haven't physically seen lots of cash. Like, you know, it would be interesting to see like a bunch of cash, wouldn't it? Like, where's the cash? And so anyway, this is a rabbit hole I know. But to, to your point, like if I were to call my broker today and say, sell everything and put it in a duffel bag, I'm coming over. That's a very hard thing to get done, right? Because we're not a world. So I, my point in all of this is, you know, this is a t- 2006, 2006 story. That was 12 fuck years ago. 
right? So 12 years ago, major companies didn't want to deal with, you know, relatively small amounts of cash in, in you know, physical cash. And so we, we just more and more live in a world where there's actually no cash. You know, my, my, my bank doesn't have my money. My, my money is in, a, is, is in a database, right? It's a, it's a fucking row in a database. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just a bunch of electrons. It's unfortunate. I, we could at least do something, uh, something with the cash. It's a, whole nother, it's a whole nother topic of, you know, what is that stuff really worth? But, um, but uh, I, I wish you had gotten that duffel bag. <laughs> Me yeah. too. That would have been poetic justice. <laughs> right? And it would have been a great photo opportunity. Well, yeah, we didn't have Instagram back then, but I would have got a little bit about Floyd Mayweather Mayweather on. You know, you see the pictures of him with all this cash and stuff. It would have been funny to, like, I don't know, throw it on the pad and roll around in it a little bit. I mean, what the fuck? And I'm not a, like, you know, money matters to me, but it's not, like, my main driver by far. But still, it would be fun to roll around in some cash. You'd remember the acquisition forever because it would be just – you'd be dreaming green for days. Yeah, and so I guess my point is, 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 as far back as 12 years ago, companies were already saying there's, a, there's some level of cash we don't want to deal with anymore. And so money really does only exist as bits, as zeros and ones. We've sort of already gotten there. And I guess since, since cryptocurrencies came, came about, I never sort of connected those dots. It's like, well, if your money doesn't actually, your bank doesn't actually have any of your money, it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it really is just a database entry then uh, if our money is a database entry, then why do we convert it back to a physical thing when we, it's already bits? Right. I mean, so where, where we're kind of going with this is um, th- these are features, right? Think about it. So the first technology was the physical coin or, or, or bills. Notes really is what they are with the in God we trust or printed on there. The next technology was kind of a digital representation of that. Um, there's actually quite a bit of IP around financial institutions, transfers, payment systems, uh, acceptance of credit cards. A lot of those are expired patents, but there's a lot of new technology that came in there. What, um, you know, what's still around and is a whole nother group of feature sets uh, that, that kind of tokenization, the blockchain and, Cryptocurrencies all are aiming to solve in a number of ways. Uh, the um, uh, w- what is still required with these fiat currencies, Chris, is uh, an intermediary, a financial institution, that bank that you go to, that you bank with, uh, that still has to act as a clearinghouse, basically clearinghouse of trust for a lot of transactions uh, to to store it, uh, to lend it. And it's pretty expensive in a way. If you think about uh, tr- transactions, there's a lot of friction in the system. Uh, there's a lot of players sticking their hand in the cookie jar. And uh, in a lot of ways, that's these financial institutions who, that we work. Who don't add any fucking value, right? Well, add, they do. Well, they add up some. Up until a point. But, right. but, but we're moving to a world, of course, mm-hmm. where... Um, if your primary value is enabling a transaction, mm-hmm. um, that's not anywhere near as valuable anymore, right? So, so distribution, digital distribution, um, mm-hmm. transforms people who are in, uh, we call it this, if you will, the trust uh, distribution and certification business, right? Right. Is, that, exactly. is that a fair way to think about it or, 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 or tell me how I should think about it? Certainly. It, yeah, it's, it's a good lens and that, and that's what, what they're in. I mean, pro- process wise, they do a number of things, but from a results perspective, I mean, that's exactly what most financial institutions do is, is act as an intermediary between parties who otherwise, you know, for various reasons, can't, you know, get a deal done or, or transact something, uh, you know, without that there. And a lot of it's physical, geographical. Uh, and uh, and uh, a lot of it overcomes uh, the, the issues related to, to physical currencies, but but payments, right? In general, like currency itself doesn't stop there. There are a huge kind of panoply, right, Chris, of other features that you can add to a currency, and that's what we've unlocked 
uh, you know, kind of humans have gotten around to, the t to this time in, 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 in deploying other technologies beyond fiat currencies. And that's what you're seeing in its proliferation, proliferate, proliferation rather, Chris. Now, thousands of different uh, cryptocurrencies with, with a number of features. And kind of at a very high level, they're, they're typically security features or, or verification features. And oftentimes, they're tailored towards different industries, whether it's kind of like the transportation industry or, or healthcare I mentioned a little earlier, uh, and, and tackles a lot of that friction that's kind of in the way. And, and, and the other major aspect of it, right, is with any transaction, any data point, uh, that's information that's valuable. And so when you hear about this, this kind of tokenization of things that happens, uh, tokenization of your data or transactional data in particular, uh, that's worth money. And so what, what often you're seeing happen with these new tokens is capturing that value that's been out there the whole time. It's just that the technology didn't really exist and the use case didn't exist uh, to do it. And that plays into the whole empowering individuals. Um, but that's, that's kind of the chronology that we walk through from physical coins to kind of digital ledgers out there uh, and accounting with financial institutions. And then now this burgeoning, very new field, really, in a lot of ways. But and, and what I love about it is we now have creativity and innovation mm -hmm. because, to your point, we didn't used to ask the question, what features does money need to have? Like right. Nobody was having that conversation 20 years ago. I don't even think anybody was having it 10 years ago. Certainly not at anywhere near the scale it is now. And so I love the creativity and the innovation of what it makes possible. Um, and I, I don't, I, you know, maybe you know where this link, thing lands. I sure don't. But I, there was no, we went through, uh, you know, we've had 300 years of the U.S. Mint you know, plus or minus, right? Yep. And I don't know when the innovation around U.S. money stopped, but I'm not an expert. So, you know, if I'm going to get myself in trouble, so be it. But I, I, I'd be willing to bet there hasn't been a lot of innovation in money it, itself in a long time. And so it's a fascinating thing now to be in this world where there's innovation and people are asking questions like, what features does money need to have for it to work in the new world? That's, I think that's exciting. Yeah, yeah, now, yeah exactly. So let, let, maybe let's tilt towards you for a sec. So um, uh, you're a young guy, right? I'm in my 30s, yeah. Yeah, way young. <laughs> and, uh, that's, um, that's my act. That's your what? I'm sorry. I said I'm I'm echoing your sentiment. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it feels it feels great to be young. I appreciate it more and more every day as as I age, Chris. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, uh, you go from thirty to fifty in about three years. Just yeah. That's been my experience. Maybe five years. That's sort of how it feels. Like it all goes down, and you know, it's weird to be. I was the youngest guy in the room. You know, I got thrown out of school at eighteen for being stupid and started a company. So for a long time. I felt like I was the youngest guy in the room. And then like one day you're like, whoa, whoa I'm, I'm the old guy in the room. But yeah, spot on. I, I get that more and more around uh, Gen Z coming in. They're coming you're in you're feeling that guys. way? You feel that way, Jordan? It's, it's slowly creeping in on me. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story. I, um, I got to working with uh, a Gerard Adams, who's either, I think he's been on your show or he, he ought to be, but he's a, one of the founders of he Elite is, he is Daily. Not. Yeah, well, I'll have to send him your way. And um, I, I, after he sold his company, which is kind of a big kind of media publication online for, for millennials, um, I, I was working with him pretty intensely after he sold it uh, most of the year of you know, 2016, 17. Still work with him today on a number of things. But one of the things that he did after he sold his first company was start a social impact startup accelerator up in newark new jersey and it, it attracted a lot of really really young you know kind of vibrant uh, energetic entrepreneurs and to your point chris i you know up to that point had always practically been you know the youngest one around but uh, there i was we had all these kind of young bootstraps man i'll tell you 17 18 19 20 very few, much beyond that, and it was a stark contrast, uh, and and quite a glimpse, though. I think, uh, I think a really, it's a great, great learning experience. 
um, to be around people of different ages and get different perspectives. I've learned to also appreciate uh, diversity, not just in, in a few different ways, but also across age. So uh, since then, I've, I've really made more of an effort to, to surround myself and pick up mentors who are, you know, there are certainly at least colleagues that are in their teens all the way up until their 70s and 80s. There's a lot you can learn from different perspectives. Uh, yeah, from, I couldn't agree more. Different ages. Yeah, yeah I couldn't agree more. I, 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 you know, I like, I guess most people have, have people of pretty much every age bracket you could imagine. Uh, you know, the older person in my life that I see the most regularly is my father in law, who's 87, and he's mm -hmm. on fire. Italian, he's mm -hmm. working the, work the family orchard. Uh, I mean, he's unbelievable. Um, and, you know, I have a lot of young entrepreneurs, young, young people uh, as well. And I couldn't agree with you more. And it's funny. Um, this may sound like some, you know, West Coast loopy doopy thing, but I forget very quickly about all that. To me, it's also like uh, all the other classifications, you know, whether it's uh, race or color or all, all that shit. Like when you're in a room full of people and there's, I don't know, eight or 10 people and you're working on something you quickly forget oh that that person's you know scottish and that person's chinese and that person oh, yeah. sri lankan or i don't know what right All, uh, it melts pretty fast and so i think that that's that's true of age too yeah i think i think definitely i think definitely and um to your point even more so it's about adding value uh you know that's that's more broadly what i credit a lot of my success um to not not just in writing but also in entrepreneurship so how great you, segue. Yeah, how do you go from uh, journalism and writing to um, being a co-founder and now chief marketing officer of a company that prints pizza? Yeah, definitely. So, so my my journalism career is is actually a bit more recent. So I've been writing for a long time, but it's only really picked up a lot of steam over the last two, maybe three years. Uh, you know, I'd contributed pieces here and there, but, you know, didn't style myself this way until maybe even, yeah, around a year or two ago. So um, I started a number of companies. One did really, really well financially. Uh, uh, still around, it's in the reputation management space, and that's where I picked up a few of those awards you mentioned earlier. The most exciting company uh, that I co-founded that, uh, that everyone likes to talk about is called BEHEX, the B-E-E-H-E-X. Uh, there's a- It's a fun name. There's a- it's a, it's a, I didn't come up with it and I know you're, uh, you have your marketing hat on right now and you're really, I never really take that, that hat off. <laughs> you know, you're really thinking about that one, but I do remember, um, I forget who his name was, but it was a journalist over at PC world and he tweeted about us and he called it, uh, it sounds like a coven of witches, uh, you know, casting spells with honey and then something about pizza. Um, but, uh, it was, it's a pretty wicked, uh, but apt, uh, yeah, I, I like it. I like it. I'm going to put a B hex on you. I like, yeah. It. There, or, or you could also say like, I'm something you could do. be hexed yeah. in between. Like it's, it, you could, if you said, so let me take a step back. I like playing with language a lot and I'm, I, I, I'm committed to being a student of language and listening to the way people use language because language creates context and tr context creates thinking. And what I know is a demarcation point in language creates a demarcation point in thinking. And when there's a demarcation point in thinking, there's a demarcation point in action. And so languaging is a fascinating, uh, fascinating topic to me. And so um, mm -hmm. I, I, lo I love it when people play with language. And behex is the kind of word that you could use in a sentence. So for example, there's a phrase we invented uh, or a word we invented called hee-haw. Mm -hmm. And what, what we mean when we say hee-haw is not the old country show, but is, uh, you know, aggravation. So for example, Jordan, I was at the airport yesterday and holy fuck, was there a lot of hee-haw in line trying to get tickets and get checked in. And you don't have to have ever heard that word before, but you now immediately know what I mean, right? And the funniest thing about hee-haw uh, is when I say it once in front of somebody, it's not unusual for them to play it back and use it in the same way. 
And be hex is that kind of word. Like if you said, geez, you know, I've been working on this math problem for the last three days and it's really got me behexed. You'll say, yeah, this is a behexing bitch of a problem, right? You could, if you used it in a sentence, people would adopt it. That's, that's what I'm trying to say to you. <laughs> and so that's why I love it. Do you guys use it in any meaningful way like that? It's, uh, I think it's coming around. I think it's come around. So, so I'm, I'm still co-founder of the company. I left uh, my role formally last year. Uh, so I was the main marketing guy on the team. Uh, did a lot of the business development. Uh, and left after we picked up funding and a U.S. Army contract. So it was very exciting to see that go from a garage, what is effectively a garage project uh, into, uh, you know, what it is today. And um, the media story you, you touched on is, is uh, you know, the story about kind of 3D printed pizza for astronauts in space. And we all know media is, it gets, it gets a bit hyperbolic. What the company really is, is a personalized nutrition uh, technology company. So just to explain that, and for everyone listening, let's say you and I, I know you mentioned a run earlier on the beach. So let's use that example. You and I go for a run on the beach, you burn vitamins and minerals up in a different way. And so let's say you burn a bit more B1, I burn a bit more B2. Well, we could have some sort of a Fitbit device on us that, you know, tracks that nutrition depletion or uh, tracks other metrics on our exercise. And the uh, the uh, 3D printers is really uh, just a robot attached to a computer. Those commu computers can communicate with each other, Chris, and that Fitbit-style device can communicate with the printer's computer uh, and teach or tell the robot to print, for example, a recovery bar. So that's kind of one of the use cases that the U.S. Army is exploring. You know, for for forward bases, for example. You know, and Jordan, if I could interrupt you, yeah. I, I assume there's some level of, you know, you use the word personalized nutrition. So that right. Fitbit-like device that right. can monitor my body and your body on that run and right. your body and my body may need slightly different things or maybe very different things, yeah. I don't know if you tell me, after that run to, to rehydrate and re-nutriize -nutri <laughs> uh, and recover effectively and so forth. And so... Uh, the bar that gets printed for you, I am assuming, is somewhat different than the bar that gets uh, printed for me. Is that is that where we're headed here? Yeah, definitely. That's exactly that's exactly right. That's where this technology goes. So so that's why you know NASA was originally so interested in this in a lot of ways. Uh, U.S. Army interest is there, and then for example, NFL, right? So in a game of inches, it really matters to see your players recover in sports and. That also helps you visualize the funnel, right? I mean, it's where that kind of performance-based technology, especially on the nutrition side and its application, can really make a difference. It, it, in contrast, what it, what, it, what it doesn't mean is that, you know, we're very unlikely to have 3D pizza printers everywhere prolifically, at least certainly not anytime soon. Um, even though, you know, I think it's been fancied that way, at least certainly by, by some media. Uh, so my local pizza parlor, parlor doesn't necessarily have to be worried about, uh, about you guys yet. They, or about, let me say it this way, they don't have to worry about getting behixed. <laughs> no, 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 be, no behexing. Um, it's definitely, definitely a bit upstream of them. Now, they do, uh, there is a lot of concern about, kind of automation in general. Um, but it's certainly, yeah, it's dominoes and, and uh, some of the other behemoths that are taking on different types of technology, more so on the transportation end. Uh, there's, a, there's a good example that is a startup out in Silicon Valley. It's, it's in an adjacent space called Zoom Pizza. And um, as far as I know with their story, they were able to secure uh, permission from the state of California to uh, basically make pizza using robots in a what looks like kind of a giant food truck on the way so you get fresh delivery and that zoom called z-u-m-e a really interesting company kind of on and off again keep tabs on them but uh yeah i've heard that, about that's that, more right they have essentially a, it's a it, it, help me here it's a food truck with robots in it 
Yep. And when you or I call or email or however we communicate with them and say, mm-hmm. we want, you know, a couple extra larges, the boys are coming over or the, for yeah. the, whatever it is. Right. And, and, and so they great, they get the order and on their way over, they're baking the pizza in the truck. That's what's going on. Right. Yeah. And they, they seem to have pulled it off so far. Um, you know, no, no comment on their, on their business come up from a financial perspective, but uh, they seem to be doing pretty well. And have you tasted the pizza? <laughs> I actually have, you know, I think it was back in um, around maybe early 2016, I want to say, uh, m- maybe later, but but a few years ago, I did co- go by their office. Uh, they are in, um, in in the Bay Area, somewhere somewhere within within earshot of Palo Alto. And uh, what they had, they had a coupon code on the side of the truck that was stationed outside the office. Um, they actually invited me in uh, and a friend of mine and took like an early, early stage kind of a tour, uh, tried some of the pizza, you know, and theirs was good. Um, they, wow. they made some pretty competitive, competitive tasting pizza. I think a lot of people listening are probably wondering about BX. So, so just as it relates to one like Zoom, so BX would be upstream of, of Zoom, right? As like an equipment provider on something like that. I don't want to represent so the, the, Zoom, the Zoom folks. The- you could tell me whether they are or they're not, but they they would be a, a customer, a potential customer, right? Vix, right? Is yeah, that what exactly. was doing, right? You you are enabling people to do these kinds of things, and yep. and so I, I got to ask you too. So, like, what does the the energy bar taste like? So, so I don't I don't know exactly on the energy bars. Um, most of the stuff's pretty good. I can tell you about the pizza. So okay. it's a pretty it's a pretty fun and interesting story. So. At first, you know, initially, you know, it was, it was terrible. Um, it was awful. I mean, think of, uh, you know, some 3D printer with extruders, multi-head extruders trying to um, print a, a dough layer, a sauce layer, you know, maybe a cheese layer, maybe something else. And um, that's a lot. That's a lot to ask of really any technology. Doesn't the cheese get stuck in the, doesn't the cheese get stuck oh, yeah. in the ink cartridge? <laughs> Yeah, it certainly, you know, it certainly could. So, so we were blessed, uh, Chris, I'll tell you what happened. So a number of chefs uh, got really interested in what we were doing. Um, for, for brevity, though, one of the kind of chief champions of what we were doing, though, was, was Pasquale Cazzolino, who has made a name for himself. Um, he's the author of The Pizza Diet. Colorably, uh, he's, he's the top pizza chef. Uh, in New York City right now, wins a lot of competitions with his kind of. What's the name of his pizza parlor? Uh, Ribalta. That's R I B A L T A. Yes. You'll you'll have to go there. Or I've when been I'm in there. New York. I didn't I didn't oh, yeah. connect that to him, but I've been there. Yeah. Very cool. And, and yeah, and so uh, so they they have a few they have a few stores. I know there's one, or at least there was one down in Atlanta, and I know they were exploring some others, but. Um, He's from that Neapolitan school of pizza, so where you have that kind of nice lip, sometimes a bubbly crust. Uh, but he was always fascinated with technology since he was a young young kid, in uh, growing up in Naples, uh, and he was one of the few chefs that experimented with like ergonomic technology. So where you would wear wearables and track the movements of chefs, so that other training chefs and others that even non chefs could learn you know the movements uh to imitate them uh and and kind of follow the 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 kind of mechanics of a recipe that that we would have so he certainly took you know separate from those projects chris took a really keen interest in what we were doing and got very very involved especially in the recipe end and uh it turns out the robots are really good and i mean damn good at making certain types of pizza some of it's a bit more unconventional probably were the biggest uh, advantages it has uh, were uh, ahead of humans was uh, with cauliflower dough of all things. It's really sticky. It's difficult to handle, but it extrudes really, really well. So there's yeah, actually if it's done right, it, it, it tastes great. The yeah, when it's exactly yeah when it's done right, it tastes great. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of iterations of how we we ultimately made pizza, but you know, kind of towards the end there, at least for a good you know eight or nine months up until when i left we had some really really good pizza uh that we were cranking out practically ever anyone and everyone who tried it uh you know seemed to love it especially kids uh, and there's a, a lot of this is documented out on the internet 
And, and the category, really the, the category for yeah. Behex, you I, let me make sure I got it right. You called it personalized nutrition. Yep. Yeah, or food tech is another way to food describe the, yeah. the genre. It, it's also pretty new. You know, just it's not anything necessarily like blockchain technology as a species, but it's yet another one of these kind of fascinating areas where it's been a relatively sleepy industry. Uh, there's not a ton of innovation in food. There certainly is. There's a lot on the product side. There's a lot on the process engineering side. But when it comes to fresh foods, with you know, which you know things like nutrition bars and, and certainly pizza are is fresh food, there there really hasn't been a lot of massive change there. You know, and this was definitely a pretty big push in the right direction to kind of help people make the better decisions on nutrition and, and certainly more narrowly. Uh, do things like feed astronauts and, and, and feed, you know, uh, war combatants at, uh, at four bases. And so I, I got to believe the Behex technology is going to make a difference over time. You tell me if I'm, how I think about it, but for people who need uh, nutrition in hard to get nutrition to places, <laughs> if I could say it that way, right? Mm -hmm. That's part of the, the, the thing that makes this cool, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there were all sorts of interesting uh, ideas on, you know, kind of the private sector, government side of, you know, air dropping in printers. I mean, they're really lightweight and compact into kind of disaster zones. I know that was an idea that floated around. Um, certainly, you and know, so yeah. we have a scenario in the future where, you know, we have this horrible crisis in Syria right now with over a million people displaced. And right. of, of course, you have Doctors Without Borders and all, all these other, you know, NGOs trying to make a difference and, and they're such inspiring people and you know of course uh, getting quote-unquote supplies is a big problem and I've heard others talk about not so much on the food side but you know that that with 3d printers we could get you know you name your thing bandages medical supplies of various sorts and so forth and so on and so is that also uh, you know a, a quote-unquote use case that you see here Oh, definitely, definitely. I, I think it's just a matter of time before you see a lot more kind of automation in emergency response. Um, kind of, you know, just think of it as another tool, uh, much like a, a really rudimentary example, you know, is an apple peeler. You know, you stick the core through the, um, the kind of core and then you spin a wheel, just like a can opener is another even more popular example. You know, we all use tools. This one maybe is a little more sophisticated. Yeah. But um, I think you'll see it proliferate. I think going down the funnel that I described earlier uh, from, from space, military, sports, you know, I think eventually you do see this stuff proliferate. And eventually we will see, uh, you know, a lot of kind of more robotized and automation technology that is more sophisticated than a can opener and oven and a microwave in all of our kitchens. It's just, you know, when does it happen? And, well, uh, and the application, you know, I, look, I think it's really cool the use case you describe with, you know, you, uh, guys like you and I wearing Fitbitty like things, and th that's very cool. I think that'll be hugely powerful for athletes, uh, and even for us weekend warrior athletes. But when I first heard about this stuff, the thing that got me the most excited was uh, the other use case, which is can we use 3D printing? to make a giant difference for uh, the people who are the most in need in our world, whether it's in need of medical care or nutrition or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, that's the one that at least for me personally is more, more fascinating. And, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, talk about age, like I, I, the older I get, Jordan, the more I think, you're either doing good in the world or you're doing shit in the world. And, and, and I know it's not binary and I know there's great, but, but the reality is if you're not doing something good for the world, then, you know, maybe you're just taking up space if you're not doing something deliberately bad. But, and so as I think about all these new technologies, the thing that excites me the most now, uh, as somebody who, who wants to see more good shit happen in our world and a lot less bad shit happen in our world, that's sort of where my head goes, you know? Yeah, I, I hear you on that. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, it's it's when we're talking about age, it's all about adding value. I, on that note, I'll I'll add one more um, 
I thought, you know, if you like these use cases, so uh, Chef Jose Andres, a lot of people know him, know his name. There's a number of restaurants out there, very outspoken as a uh, kind of like immigrant chef. I know he was in a little bit of a tiff with the current administration. Um, uh, not, a, not a political thing, but he, uh, he had a suggestion for us. And I know we, we explored it quite a bit. You know, I thought it was interesting. It was, it was uh, lozenges uh, that could be printed. So there's, there is a cohort of people that uh, very sadly, Chris, have throat cancer or some other kind of, uh, kind of interference uh, with taste with their mouth. And uh, only a small spot of their kind of throat can allow them to taste. And uh, it's, it's otherwise somewhat difficult to create capsules and other kind of what is essentially other technology to allow people like that in those, in those circumstances to taste things. And one of the approaches we took was, was potentially 3D printing you know, certain lozenges so that they'd be time capsuled and, and like certain sizes and even personalized uh, so that people who had uh, you know, ailments of that sort, the throat cancers, for example, could again taste things because the flavor profile was released in a certain way, a certain time, wow. a certain shape. So and, if I, uh, as listen, a result, let me make sure I understand the use case. If I, as a, let's say I have throat cancer, tongue cancer, something along those lines. And as a result of that, I'm losing some portion or maybe, you know, some meaningful portion of my taste buds, Right. which if you've ever had that happen to you, it's a very weird thing. Um, so I could print a lozenge that was personalized, purpose-built for me. I would right. consume that lozenge and that lozenge would in some way wake up, if you will, my my senses in my mouth that have been uh damaged by the cancer and so i could enjoy i could i could 3d print my lozenge ahead of 3d printing my yummy pizza and and i could enjoy my pizza is that is that where we're going here jordan <laughs> yeah that that was certainly the idea i mean certainly from a from a science standpoint it was possible to do and it was certainly possible from a technology standpoint so the only thing in the way was just a good application of it and you know, just go ahead and do it. Um, so that's another. That's another. And so point does that exist motor. today, or is that something you guys are working on at BHEX, or how should I think about that in the progression of three D printing? Yeah, I think it's. I think it's another theoretical, more so use case uh, that could very much be reduced to practice today. It, it's one of these that's kind of in the pipeline, in the timeline. Um, so if we roll, matter. if we if we rolled forward, I don't know, I'll just pick a date three years from now. Yep. Is the BHEX technology with, with others, I'm sure, because of course it lives in an ecosystem in the 3D sure world, right? Sure. right. Um, so I imagine it's a, it's a collection of technologies that have to come together to make this stuff happen. Uh, but are we two to three years away from that kind of a scenario? Are we five years, 10 years? Like, where are we on this journey to be able to do the kinds of things you're describing? Yeah, certainly. So, so narrowly on the lozenge is certainly just a couple of years to actually do it. Uh, for it to be widespread, it might be 10 or more, right? And, and that's, that's a product of, uh, that's a very common obstacle is, is just because you can do something once doesn't mean you can do it uh, cost scale. effectively for, yeah, exactly, at, at scale. But what, what's most exciting really, I, you know, I'm not too much of a fantasy person. I really do like to see things happen. But um, where I usually sit is, is on those firsts, is, you know, where and how do we, where, how, and when can we push that frontier to do something for the first time and take an idea, which ideas are cheap. It's, it's all in the execution, but it's such a satisfying thing, especially when you're- I actually don't know if ideas are people. cheap, but um, I, I get your point. Uh, so I'm yeah. curious, so you're not at BHICS anymore, uh, but of course you're one of the founders, co-founders. Um, uh, you're writing all this stuff. You've become what I think a lot of, uh, I've read recently, there's been a number of studies done that say the number one thing millennials want is to be famous. Uh, and and um, I wouldn't, I don't know, you tell me, I, I'm not sure I'd think about you as being famous, but you're certainly known uh, and, and have a following and a level of respect in, in the sort of digital, um, you know, thought leadership, uh, writing, uh, you know, journalistic world. Is that, is it fair? Sure. I think that's fair. You know, I think on the first thought, 
fame isn't something I'm necessarily after. I mean, I think that's that one is a double edged sword. I do think though it's useful to as freely and as inexpensively as possible try to help coach people when and where you can. And you know, I do think and I've learned because I've been told that a lot of things that I've done, especially in the tech space, um, have been inspirational. You know, and, and I'm frankly most encouraged by that. It, it, it's exciting to do these things, but I, I can continue to do them. So, you know, along with my writing, I do continue to consult, Chris, a number of emerging technology companies. I do. So, think is that really where you're going? You're consulting and advising yeah. startups as opposed to doing your own, or do you think you'll do more? Or kind of where's your head at? Oh yeah, I'll definitely dive back in. I think I've got at least a few more good ones in me, um, and it's just kind of the right place, right time. But I'll just give you a sampling. As some of the folks I'm working with now, one that I think is really exciting is uh, is Drapel Fabrics and Drapel Labs. Uh, Sim Galati. How do you spell that? That's Drapel. That's D R E. Sorry, D R O P E L, and then Fabrics. And what these guys do, uh, they've innovated beyond polyester in the stain-proof, spill-proof space. So what they've been able to do is go down to the yarn level and make, for example, cottons, uh, cashmere, stain-proof and spill-proof. It's, it's awfully useful technology. Uh, I style it kind of like, like Velcro, right? Where you could, this is just something that should be everywhere because why would you not want everything to be stain proof spill proof and done in a sustainable way so that's one that we can so 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 and if i could just underscore that if i understand that world what what what, um these guys are trying to do is you can have a cashmere that feels exactly like a super ding dong cashmere from uh wilkes bashford or needless markups or whoever it's a very high-end ding dong cashmere but uh um uh, ding dong being a word we made up for high end. Um, uh, you know, like, it's also a great word for me because I never fucking remember anything, you know, like I go have all these nice dinners and things and people will bring all this wonderful wines. Oh, you know, what, 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 what wine was that you had last night? Oh man, we had a Chateau Neuf ding dong. It was fucking awesome. Right. It, it allows me to not uh, be specific and get away with it, but, but I digress. So you could take a pile of mud, a pile of crap, a pile of, you know, stuff that would normally make a horrible stain, red wine, whatever it is, and pour that shit on a beautiful, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, white or, or bone colored. I've recently realized, heard that bone is a color. A cashmere. Oh, yeah, I don't. You know, I grew up in a world where there was only a couple primary colors, but you know, there's now there's chartreuse. Anyway, I digress. So you could you could pour red wine on your bone colored cashmere, and it would be bulletproof. The shit wouldn't do any damage. That's where we're at. Is that right? Yeah, it's, and that's why it's it's one of the most exciting technologies. Uh, I think I I uh, I was going to recommend. You know, Sim ought to come on. Uh, there, there is some really good video out there uh sim is the ceo of Drapel, to be clear there's some really so good you're video advi- out there. you're advising them is that what you're you're consulting with them yep yeah exactly and this is one you know one of the companies that i that i help out and i'm just feel very lucky to be able to do to do this at all and i, I think a lot of it lends itself from my kind of earlier days in emerging tech um, but but that's one of them and and you know i think these guys have a really good shot at kind of changing the world changing the fashion world and and uh, to your point or to your question, yeah, you know, a lot of us spill. A lot of us are clumsy out there. A lot, some of us and, are way spill. <laughs> yeah. Some of us are spilly. Some of us are spilly. That's another word that. Uh, spilly. I like that. I'm very uh, spilly. Yeah, that's kind of made its way into popular, popular vernac- vernacular. In my wedding like vows, uh, Jordan, I, I promised to make messes for Carrie, my wife, to clean up. <laughs> Perfect. So she could just use some, uh, she, she could just uh, dress you in your pal and it's one less, uh, one less load to do. We, we may need to have the whole place r- drapelled. <laughs> Actually, I got to believe, uh, uh, are they working on uh, fabrics for um, furniture? Yeah, I, I, right now it's, it's, it's the, the focus is definitely in fashion, but I do know right now it's the whole range. Uh, yeah. You know, it's a technology. I, you know, I, I What I else are you doing in school? Oh, yes. So some, some other projects. One really popular one up in New York is a Hoochap. It's a subscription drinks app. It's a bit more fun one. Um, What's but, it called? Uh, 
It's called Hooch App, and that's H-O-O-C-H, uh, run by a very, very talented CEO and very hard working. Oh, CEO. Hooch App. Nine. Got it. Like Hooch. Yeah. Oh, like Hooch, hooch, is, like hooch the, uh, is a great word. We like, to drink, we like to drink Hooch. <laughs> and so what does yeah. hooch, hooch App do? Yeah, so, so it's a subscription drinks app. And what users do is pay $10 a month and they get 30 free drinks a month at around 600 plus participating uh, bars and lounges. So they're in nine cities plus Hong Kong. If you're in LA, San Francisco, for example, New York, uh, you, you show the app. It's a, effectively a payment tool, which gives you a really good idea where this company is actually headed. They also have a I lot just want to make sure I understand. Idea. I subscribe to Hooch app 10 bucks a yep. month. And for 10 exactly. bucks a month at restaurants who've registered or participating in the network or however I should think about it, right. I can go in there and I can consume 30 drinks. <laughs> not, not in one shot. So there is a limit. Oh, okay. Well, it's a that good was a great night out. Eh? <laughs> you were, you were, you were about to, although it would be difficult. A lot, not many of us can make it to 30, you know, kudos to you if you could. Um, I got a but Scottish you are limited to one, one a day. Got it. I see. So theoretically, you could have a drink a day, but that. So when I go to my favorite new local restaurant and they they're part of the network, I show them my thing, and I get a free uh, beer or a free you know, Jack or whatever it is. Spot on. Yeah, spot on. And you know, if you if you spend much time in New York, and I know out your way, you know, drink prices at bars and lounges are are not low. I mean, you might be set back ten dollars just for one. Oh, easily. Uh, so, yeah. And then on the marketing side, so it's, you know, I, I, I know this from Groupon's days and, and um, you know, some of it, it's, it's peers. It's, it's what I still call tripwire marketing, right? Where it's an unbelievably good deal and it actually works and, and, and actually multiple parties benefit. So uh, stepping in the shoes of the, the restaurants, the, the bars and lounges, you know, they get the foot traffic, right? So they might have a bit of a give, giveaway. Uh, on something, but the average receipt is somewhere between fifty and one hundred and fifty dollars that these users tend to spend after, yeah. you know, and during they get that one kind of free drink. And there's there's a lot of influence, um, no pun intended, I suppose, <laughs> at play. You know, at play there, you know, reciprocity, you know, kind of everything else. I mean, you don't typically want to just go in somewhere and get something for free. Oftentimes, you stay for a reason, of or course. you feel you know, I, I'll, I'll order food with that or let's, you know, you, you go with a few friends and so you get them drinks and it kind of discounts the total receipt a bit, but uh, they, they seem to love it. Um, there's been some uh, kind of new changes with bartenders. So they seem to be very much on board and uh, the company's doing really well, like 150,000 uh, user kind of subscribers now. And I see a lot of growth there, but that's another one that I think would be really interesting for you to, talk to at some point it's a very uh, cool idea can... the other thing i like about that idea is um these network effect companies are fascinating right right uh because there is a theoretical exponential growth opportunity um yep. so uh, that's very cool all right any other cool things you want to share that you're working on any other cool companies jordan yeah for sure i'll do um Plug a few more in quick succession, and we can pick them apart. And then I'll, I do have to, I do have to run after that. Yeah, no, we we can. What I worked with for, yeah, for a long time, Chris, a fascinating company called Crowd Optic. Uh, the founders alone are, are are fascinating themselves. They've sold a few companies. You know, their first one, uh, by their CEO at Crowd Optic, his name is John Fisher, a really interesting guy. But his first company he sold to what is now AutoNation. His second to what is now Roper Technologies, a public company. His third to Oracle. And if that's not enough, uh, he's working on CrowdOptic, which is fairly the leader in, in the augmented reality space. If you remember the original Google Glass partners, well, CrowdOptic was the one with all the intellectual property, all the patents on you know, inheriting the view of other users. And, and that's part so of the itself. technology behind the glass holes. <laughs> Yeah, well, in a, in a lot of yeah, in, in a lot of ways, um, uh, and particularly on the enterprise side. So, one of the latest things that they're working on is uh, is live streaming facial recognition. So, in real time, 
Uh, so where, uh, you know, police, ambulatory, whatever it is, uh, can get data on people, uh, read uh, and recognize faces. Wow. Uh, and, yep. And, and so and the learn cops would be able to, be able to um, live stream my photo and know that right. I am or am not the psycho killer they're looking for. Right, exactly. And that's easy to tap into a, or tie into a database. So yeah, one of their more recent deals is with NEC, but they have a lot of integrations with everyone from Cisco to Intel to, to HPE. And a lot of these large enterprises, they also have other enterprise clients, whether they're hospitals or sure. fire departments, uh, sports teams. You know, I know these guys were working with uh, NASCAR, uh, certain NFL teams like the Broncos, and there's some coverage of this out there for personalized jum jumbotrons, uh, for kind of virtual high fives, a lot of high five with, with players on the field. So a lot of, you know, kind of <laughs> fun and, and gimmicky use cases, but you could see where a lot of this technology goes. It's, it's awfully useful. And uh, again, yeah, that's where I like to sit is kind of at the forefront and, and uh, you know, push it along a bit more if it's in a, if it's in a technical sense, but yeah, well, and the thing I love about AR, you know, my mind goes to those do-gooder type use cases as well, right? And so I think it is incredibly exciting to think about uh, an EMT out in the field with somebody who's got a, you know, gnarly situation. Right. And they could be with a doctor, uh, you know, real time. That doctor could be, you know, the incident could be in California and the doctor could be in India or wherever the hell it is. And, right. and the doctor is coaching. Uh, that EMT through what to do. Uh, that That is fascinating shit right there. Um, sure. Yeah. Well, you yeah, are an incredible, really you're an incredible guy. You're, you're, you're a, um, you're a man of, uh, you're an international man of mystery right now. And I, I love, here's what I love about what you're doing, Jordan. You know, we get taught in school for the most part, we get taught by air quotes society that our job is to, figure out what we like and don't like, figure out what our quote unquote skills are, and then go out through our education after our education and find our place in the world. Oh, I'm good at math, but, 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 yada, yada, I'm an accountant or I'm an engineer or however it plays out, right? But what, what we get taught is our job is to figure out where we fit. Uh, you tell me, I, I feel like you have not found a place but you have made a place. You're this journalist, writer, you're this entrepreneur, and now you're like playing with these different companies that are fairly leading edge, and you're sort of this renaissance man. And yeah, so I, you, you created your own place in the world, right? You're your own thing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's spot on. I mean, part of that's evolution of, of, of what a job is. Another part of it is, is kind of like breaking conventional wisdom, you know, with that. Um, you know, I've always kind of thought a bit outside the box. I'm, you know, I, I have the accolades, right? I am an engineer. I am an intellectual property attorney. Sure, but those are all just tools, right? And what I always wanted to do was apply myself. And, you know, life's short, little time that you have. And if you're truly not afraid of failure, this is where you go. You go to the kind of cutting edge or bleeding edge of things. And um, look, a lot of stuff doesn't work. Uh, a lot of stuff <laughs> kind of goofed up all the time. Um, you know, you've, you've even asked me to kind of put together timelines on a few things. And, uh, you know, even this podcast, and they're awesome questions. They're, they're the best ones to try to try to guess at. And, and it really is, they're targets and they're motivational. Yeah. And they always, they always do encourage me a lot to, to push things. Uh, but, um, you know, I might be a good example of where, you know, people are headed, right? In an increasingly sort of independent freelance economy, I definitely carved a niche. I have a, you know, I have a great team that I work with behind me and also, you know, great sets of founders at a few different companies, um, both on the consultative side and also on the co-founding side that, you know, have helped me in my journey and vice versa, you know, and continue to build more. But, um, you know, if you want to move at this speed, you got to, you got to do that and do a couple of things that complement each other. So. Well, um, and I, I really I, want to I, applaud you for your leadership on that. I, I, uh, I do think Jordan, you are an example of the new model of how to have a legendary career, right? Which is you have a lot of interests. You've got a you know big brain, 
um, and 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 you've created this environment where you know you can uh, think about things and write about things and do that whole thing. You got your whole conference circuit thing that you're out in the world doing stuff, meeting stuff, meeting people, and then you've got this portfolio of clients and companies that are you know. So you've got a very uh, stimulated brain, and you've really if you will, created, designed, uh, and I'll use the word job for yourself that represents, uh, you know, all the areas of interest that you have. And, and there, there is no company that's ever going to hire you to do this shit, right? There's no job at G GE called what Jordan does, right? I not, not, not that I, not that I know of, uh, and it's, it's, it's fair too. So a lot of, uh, people, maybe, <laughs> had a call coming in M much wiser speak, speak of the devil right uh you know much wiser say jordan you're you're really rather unemployable and i and i mean that as a, as a huge compliment and um you know it's, it's this type of thinking right i mean you you often are trying to disrupt things a bit more um, be a change agent uh move things a little bit faster think about things in a different way and and you have to accept that yeah it's that sometimes it's it's a dead end and it doesn't work and you kind of have to navigate around it. And it's that, that challenge that's a driver. I think a lot of us have it in us, but like you said, certainly Chris, educational wise and uh, kind of society wise, it, it drives against it. Um, but I, I certainly have more of a fear of, you know, not doing more things than I do of just, totally blowing something up accidentally or, or goofing uh which you know it happens and um and sometimes we learn right that's that's what we want to do is learn as much as we can i'll leave you the one quote uh and it's from elon musk a, a conversation is not one that i have so it's so it's had what but it's here saying it was on that first spacex launch he had he had no expectation that that thing would even get off the ground um much less return it did both uh, you know, and that's that style, right? I mean, that's that inspiration. Uh, and that's that motivation is, you know, look, just because no one else has tried it before doesn't mean that you can't. Yes. Uh, the way I think about it is entrepreneurs, and I, I love your Elon example. I, I think his greatest gift is the inspiration. Uh, I think he's an icon of possibility. Forget any of the specifics he's doing, which I think are very cool as well. But, um, and so for me, um, why I love entrepreneurs so much is entrepreneurs are the people who slay the cynicism of our times with their dreams. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, and, and it's not it's not a selfish motivation. I mean, look, we're a lot of us are here to give. Um, you know, I make a great number too. I mean, in terms of finding myself, like that's where I sit. Like I'm I'm really good at tacking into, uh, you know, what I think are good ideas and helping execute on them. Uh, you know, I think that's often the, the lens that you want to best use to apply yourself in terms of, you know, the question of where do you fit uh, and then go at it. And, and when you do find and figure out where you are in the stack, um, whether it's, you know, kind of a number one, a two or three and so on, uh, you know, you do you do slot in. You can do some pretty incredible things over time. Yeah. All right. Anything before we kick out of this wave, Jordan? Yeah. If you want to. Uh, if anyone out there wants to follow me, and I'm on, I'm on practically every channel. Easy to find, Jordan French, that's J-O-R-D-A-N, and then French, F-R-E-N-C-H, just like the, uh, the basketball player, River Country, and then like the language. Uh, uh, but yeah, follow me, follow my work. I'm pretty active out there, and, uh, and it's thestreet.com if you want to follow my writing on, on crypto. Uh, and uh, looking forward to seeing a lot of you out there. Awesome. And we'll make sure all your contact stuff is in the show notes and, you know, all that good shit. For Jordan, a sure. uh, fascinating discussion. I really appreciate it. Again, thank you so much for uh, naming us one of the top podcasts for entrepreneurs and CIO.com. That was very, very uh, fonzy of you. I appreciate it. Namaste. Certainly. And uh, um, you're awesome. Thank you so much. You too. I'll see you out there, Chris. Thanks again. Be legendary, my friend. Whew. If you loved this episode as much as I did, 
Uh, why not share it on social media right now? And if there's somebody in your life who you think would benefit, you can email them uh, this episode. We would also love it if you wrote us a review. Your reviews help to spread legends and losers and um, uh, get the word out and let people know that we're, um, you know, don't, don't suck, or at least we're trying hard not to. <laughs> anyway, we really appreciate it. It uh, warms the cockles of our, uh, of our hearts. Now, our friends at NetSuite are committed to your growth. They are the category queen or category king of uh, business management software in the cloud for growing enterprises and actually nonprofits as well. As a matter of fact, NetSuite is over 10 times the size of its closest competitor. That's called category power, category queen power right there. And NetSuite um, is now part of Oracle. And as you probably know, Oracle is one of the largest technology companies in the world. So when you plug into NetSuite, you access the power of one of the biggest uh, uh, infrastructures you could possibly imagine in the cloud. Now, according to the U.S. Department of, uh, of uh, Small Business Administration, outfits with 500 or less employees, uh, who they define as small businesses, generate 61.8% of all the new jobs. Smally entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial businesses build our world. And NetSuite is the business management system for powering entrepreneurial businesses. Organizations like uh, ASICs, the running shoe folks, the athletic folks, GoPro, Big Agnes, uh, Tents, who I've actually had out in the back country with me, great products, Blue Microphone, Free Flow Wines, and Guitar Center, uh, bet their business growth on NetSuite. Now, for um, uh, Legends and Losers listeners, um, my friends at NetSuite are offering you a uh, one-hour growth review with a growth expert in your industry. When you go to netsuite.com slash legends, what you can do there is uh, sign up to ha set, set up this dialogue for dealing with uh, opportunities and barriers to growth and get a copy of their paper, the Bar uh, Overcoming the Barriers for Growth. NetSuite is really the, the, the opportunity that you have to put your business in the cloud, fight off the bad guys, compete, and win at scale. So if you want to learn how to acquire new customers, increase profits, and uh, optimize your cash flow, check out netsuite.com slash legends. All right. We would like to thank today's guest, Jordan French. You can check him out at jordanfrench.org. HarperCollins Instant Classic, Play Bigger. That's my first book, How Pirates, Dreamers, and Innovators Create and Dominate Markets. Stay tuned. Niche Down with Heather Clancy is coming out soon. Also, equitydirectory.com, connecting startups to the talent and resources they need to build a legendary business. And a nonprofit we love, started by a man I love, Tim Road, onelifefullylived.org. We are the nonprofit helping you dream, plan, and live your best life. We've tried to put all sorts of uh, ideas and, and approaches and tools for you there. We run conferences throughout the U.S., and we try to do it as close to free as possible because we're a nonprofit. We just want you to have a legendary life. Check out onelifefullylive.org. Our good friends at interviewvalet.com. If you're a thought leader, get your leading thoughts on podcasts. Check out interviewvalet.com. The legendary 1185 design. There is a reason all of the top brands and all the top companies in Silicon Valley walk through the doors of 1185. Check them out, 1185design.com. Our good friends and our guests, uh, Joe and Bix Bixen at Bixen2. These are the folks that help senior executive teams hack the future to produce the material results they want. Check them out at Bixen2.com. Habitat for Humanity. This is an extraordinary nonprofit helping to build homes and new futures. Check out habitatforhumanity.org. Um, Tahoe Truckee Homes, our good friend Matt Hansen and his, and his team. If you want to live in Tahoe, you want a vacation home in Tahoe, Matt and the folks at Tahoe Truckee Homes are who you want to talk to. Check them out. The Museum of Failure in beautiful Sweden, the unofficial but loved Museum of Legends and Losers. Check them out at Museum of failure.se and 800 ceo read check out business books don't be a loser read something they're great people they have great books check them out 800 ceo read.com all right we would like to remind you that today's information is provided to you solely for informational purposes and this podcast is the sole property of the legends and losers podcast network but we would love you if you shared the shit out of it now we must remind you 
We must remorn you, whatever remorn you means. <laughs> Legends and Losers is clearly produced in a studio that does contain nuts, although it is never tested on GMOs or animals. Although if you're uh, watching on YouTube, you can see I've got my, uh, my dear friend Abigail, the dinosaur, with me. Keep your eyes on the road and your hands upon the wheel. Listen to the tragically hip, God bless Adam West. Don't forget, Legends and Losers is a great last minute gift idea. Introduce two people you love to two podcasts you love. And uh, hey, Colin, this oddcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Our deepest apologies today go to Marcus Rust, CEO of Rose Acre Farms. Sorry, Marcus, we just ran out of time for you. That's it. I want to thank you so much for investing part of your life with us, and we look forward to seeing you again soon on Legends and Losers. <laughs>